What I work really on is, is on the issue of so social equity, um, particularly for the very poorest people. As I mentioned, we have 1.6 billion people lacking access to electricity. Another 1 billion people have um, intermittent grid access. Another 2.5 to 3 billion people are using traditional biomass to meet their cooking needs. Now, what does that mean at the level of the household? It means, first of all, um, on the cooking side, that uh, um, women and children are exposed to very high levels of indoor air pollution that kills prematurely about 2 million women and children per year. That's more than die of malaria on an annual basis. Well, I was in uh, Kakabila, which is an indigenous mosquito community off the east coast of Nicaragua, um, about 18 months, almost two years ago, visiting a village that for the first time had a small wind turbine. And what was that doing? That was providing lighting for the school um, so that in the evenings women could take literacy classes so they could actually become more educated. It was charging the cell phones. People already had cell phones. But the problem was that until they had the wind turbine there, they actually had to take a boat 45 minutes across the lagoon to the next village over where they actually had some electricity before they could charge them. Those cell phones not only provide access to market for some of the goods that they provide so they can get better in indications on pricing, they also provide a connection when women are in, in labor and they have medical issues of helping to get access to hospitals. At the same time, they had a second wind turbine that they put up on the medical clinic. Now, not only did that provide refrigeration for some of the medications that were required in the village to help refrigerate them, but it was also an incentive for them to be able to actually have a doctor who lived in the village. Why? Because the doctor coming out from a town was used to having electricity and nobody was going to stay there and live there, and the same with the teachers, without that access to electricity. So providing that not only provided um, increased opportunities in terms of livelihood, and there are many, many ways that providing that access can uh, help with increasing livelihoods, whether it's for small farmers who can use solar-powered drip irrigation um, to help with, uh, with uh, watering their crops, whether it's the lighting in the home that a lot of people tend to dismiss and say, well, that's just for consumption purposes, it's not really productive. Well, it's productive if you can actually run your home-based business for a couple of extra hours in the evening. It's productive if your children are able to actually see to do their homework in the evening and can do better in school. It may not be productive in today's dollars, but your children down the road are getting a better education. Now, one of the other myths about the poor is, uh, is that, of course, um, these kinds of technologies are too expensive for the very poor. You know, we say solar is expensive for the rich, renewable exp energies are expensive for the rich. Actually, very often, they're the most affordable um, type of energy that's available to the poor. Another important statistic from the report, 110 million households in Africa at the lowest income level spend more than 4 billion US dollars per year on kerosene-based lighting, which is costly, inefficient, unsafe, and unhealthy. Now, the really good news there is that for what you're paying for kerosene-based lighting, which is often four, five, ten US dollars per month for a household. These days, we have solutions that are available, small scale, sure, um, but photovoltaic solutions and others that are coming onto the market with LED technologies that did not exist 10 years ago, with better battery solutions, and because of, they're more efficient as well, they require smaller amounts of solar panels to help charge them, that actually cost the same or less than what the, uh, what the households are already paying for a kerosene-based lighting solution. Now, why is that important? First of all, it's very difficult in terms of the price point for the poor sometimes to pay upfront $200 or $300 for a solar home system, which is what used to be the, the only available system to them. At the same time now, though, there are opportunities through microfinancing, through new financing mechanisms, through carbon financing, to help support the very poor to be able to access some of these solutions. I'm not advocating that we should be doing everything off-grid for the very poor. Certainly, we should be continuing with grid extension. We should be continuing to look at microgrid opportunities as well. But the interesting thing about pushing a green economy and supporting a green economy is that it's already happening. And as, as others have already said, the, the challenge is really to help scale it up more quickly Using the market, there are very, very um, uh, good solutions now that are unsubsidized. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I know Kenya had the largest unsubsidized solar uh, photovoltaic market in the world. Kenya, um, not Germany. 
Um, and so I think the opportunity that presents itself for us is really to see not only in a very narrow definition of what's it providing in terms of today's jobs or what's it providing in terms of reduction of fossil fuels today, but also looking at the much broader paradigm of what's it providing in terms of access to better health, better education, better livelihoods, which may help to make the poor uh, less vulnerable.